for joining us again, Mark and Lord from the Ontario Centers of Excellence. Uh, we've got really, uh, I'm really pleased here to have this speaker this morning all the way from uh, sunny California. Apparently it's not so sunny these days. Um, but we, uh, this morning we're all about gaming. And so the next presentation in, is uh, Platforms Evolution. And uh, we have uh, Mr. David Coombs, who's the uh, Platform Research Manager with uh, computer, uh, Sony Computer Entertainment America. Please, David. Uh, welcome. Hello. So uh, let's just play the video. Um, <laughs> and, and I apologize that 3D may be a bit strong on this, especially if you're sitting close to the front. Let's end the video at the end of this clip because it's, I don't know what's going on with the projector right now, but it's, it's kind of closing my video a little bit. So everyone hold the finger up in front of your face like this, close one eye, and then open the other eye. What you're probably going to see is your finger moves from one side to the other side when you do that. So that's parallax, that's one of the things that makes 3D work. You've got two eyes and a set of different images to each eye. Now the other thing we can experiment with is convergence, which is another aspect of 3D. So you hold your finger out in front of your face this time, and keep both eyes open this time, and move it towards your nose, and eventually bring out your nose. See how that feels. Okay, keep doing that. Will I take a picture? <laughs> this is the Fuji 3D camera. It's pretty cool. 
so those are two of the things that are part of what makes 3D work, and that's what we're, when we're sending two different images, one to your left eye, one to your right eye, that's what we're doing, we're replicating the fact that your eyes see different things and you're able to converge at different depths. That's what, that's what the 3D that we're simulating is all about. Um, so the interesting thing about 3D is, even though we talk about 3D like it's this big new thing that came along with Avatar, it's actually been around for, it was invented about 10 minutes after photography was invented, realistically. The camel pictures here are from, I think it was 1897. Um, and I guess 3D pictures were really popular back then. They had these little 3D mirrors you could slide these pictures into and look at the 3D pictures. The other picture there is actually, that's a normal Norman Rockwell painting from 1922 of a, a child looking at 3D pictures through one of these 3D mirrors. So 3D's been around for a really long time. It's not something that's new. We just happen to be at a point now where the technology and displays has made it really easy to do 3D in the living room and really like this way. So here's a couple more examples of the kind of 3D that's been around for a long time. Um, I'm assuming everyone here has tried a Viewmaster at some point. I mean, they, they, you know the little red things, click, 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 kind of cool. Um, if you're a fan of 3D, I recommend you check out these, uh, there's a whole series of these um, 3D books that you can get. Um, there's one on New York, there's one on London, there's one on Gettysburg. Um, so going back to the um, Civil War, there was uh, 3D photographers taking pictures. So you can check those out, they're pretty neat. So viewing's always been a problem. Um, how do you view 3D? So there's, you know, some people can actually do it just by looking at two images. They can do free viewing, cross-site free viewing. I can't do that. It's crazy. It's amazing. Um, <clears throat> back in the 50s, a lot of what people did for 3D with features like Creature from the Black Lagoon is they'd use analog, so they'd use color to multiply the image. And that works pretty well with black and white, doesn't work so well with color, obviously, because you've got color in the image. So that's not so good. So, meanwhile, what's been going on in the last five years with LCDs is everyone's been saying, well, LCD is really blurry. Can you do something about the refresh rate? So, Five years ago, LCD TVs were really blurry and smeary. Now they all update at 120 hertz. Well, if you can update at 120 hertz with no latency and no lag, then you can display alternating pictures at 60 frames a second. Then all you need is a set of glasses that do this, and you've got 3D because you're sending a different image to each eye. Um, so that's how we get 3D working on modern TVs, and that's that's how it can be so prevalent today. And the, the Christie projector that we're using here today does something similar where it's, it's using I believe these are actually flicker glasses, so it's actually synchronized with the projector, the projector's flickering faster than you can see it flickering. Um, so the interesting thing about 3D TVs is 3D TVs kind of started to come on the market before there was a standard for how to connect things to the 3D TVs. Um, and so there were a few 3D games that shipped before the HDMI 1.4 standard became widely adopted, and those typically came with a giant table, like this table I'm showing at the bottom there, and you'd have to figure out which one of the TVs you had, and then you'd have to figure out whether that TV expected the left image to come first or the right image, whether they were packed vertically or horizontally, or if they were interlaced or checkerboard. The jillion different formats. Complete nightmare for the end user, because the end user has to become an AV expert. And you know, there's, there's like five of us AV experts in the room right now, and we couldn't get it right today. So, I mean, how does the, how does the home consumer do it? Um, so the HDMI 1.4 solves that problem, it's industry-wide support, there's no format war, everybody's using this, it means you can buy a Samsung TV, connect up a Sony Blu-ray player, it just works. Um, also, the nice thing about this is the PS3, every single one of them supports HDMI 1.4, so every single PS3 out there can do 3D Blu-rays and play 3D games on. So the formats that the PS3 support, these are mandatory formats, um, we support full um, 1080p to each eye at 24 frames a second to read and play back. That's a full HD to both eyes, it's not splitting the HD between the eyes, it's not frame packed. And then for games, we have 1280 by 720 and uh, 60 or 50 hertz. So you get a really high quality, full resolution frame rate to both eyes. So, how do you make a game in 3D? What's, what's involved? Well, there's, there's two aspects there's the art and there's the science. So I've got two pictures here. On the left, I've got a picture of, um, that's actually Mars. It's the crawler on Mars. They used 3D pictures because it was easier to see, you know, rocks and stuff like that when they were planning on how to drive around. On the right, that's a painting that Salvador Dali did in 1977. It's a stereoscopic painting. And if you're really good at free, free viewing, you can just go stand in the back of the room, focus on that, and you'll be able to see that in 3D. Um, I can't do that. <laughs> 
So the simplest way to do 3D is to render everything twice. And this is a very similar analog to if you're making a 3D movie. In a 3D movie, you have two lenses in your camera, and you can take two images, and then you play them back. And if your cameras are about the same distance apart as your eyes, it'll just work. Um, so in video games, we can kind of do the same thing. Um, we just have two cameras and render everything twice. Obviously, rendering everything twice is a little bit expensive. The really good thing about that is it's completely correct. We can model everything exactly. The downside is you've got to render everything twice. It takes twice as long. The other thing that you can do in games is you can you can do um, you can do a, like a stereo conversion. The really nice thing about games compared to movies is that as part of the process of rendering the frame for a game, we have a depth buffer. We have a buffer that tells us for each pixel what the closest thing in the scene is. And that's exactly the information we need to do the reprojection. So we're in really good shape if we want to do um, stereo reprojection, we can do that. And there's a middleware company called Triavis that provides a solution. There's a bunch of developers who are creating their own solutions for that. It has a few problems. Obviously, you've only got a limited amount of information. You can't, as, as you, you know, I've, I've rendered the scene from this angle. Now I want to make a version from this angle and a version from this angle. But I'm going to have some holes. I'm going to have some little issues. I'm going to have to figure out the way to fix up. And that, that takes some shenanigans and some secret sauce. Um, and that's, that's something that you know, everyone's working on, figuring out better ways of doing. Um, and there's also some issues with transparency and things like that. So you can get some artifacts. But there's obviously, because you've got a limited amount of information to start with, there's a limit to how much separation you can put into a game using this technique. However, it turns out you don't really need a lot of separation in a 3D game to make a really nice experience. I'll cover, cover that on a later slide. <clears throat> and the pros of this approach for us is it's very, it's very easy to integrate. It's a low performance impact. It's not like you're rendering everything twice. This is more like you're just adding another post effect. So maybe two milliseconds, maybe four milliseconds to do this, whereas rendering the entire scene machine again might be 16, 20 milliseconds, something like that. So it's it's very simple to add because it's you're just doing it at the end of the game, you just go, okay, you create these new pictures. Um, but it's less there's less control, the quality is not as good, and there could be some artifacts. I'm not sure if I uh, don't remember what my next slide is. Um, okay, so, so which would you choose? Um, if you've got lots of budget and you really want the highest quality experience, you're going to want to render everything twice. Um, but for a lot of cases, the reprojection works just fine. It's really, it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we were really concerned that transparency wouldn't and reflections wouldn't look right when you reproject. And in a lot of cases, they look fine. But one of the things that will mess you up with reprojection is if you have um, a lot of uh, like laser beams and transparent things in the scene that don't update the depth buffer because then you don't have the information for the depth of those laser beams so they just get rendered at the depth of whatever was behind them at the time so if you have a laser beam and it crosses a pillar it looks like it's really far away and then it suddenly gets close and it's far away so it can, that can lead to some interesting artifacts so we have to be very careful when we do that kind of thing so it's a really you know choose the right uh, course of the course so let's talk about art. So the, the goal with art is to make it look good, to make it comfortable. Um, one of the things we figured out fairly quickly was that actually if you have too much depth, it can take a really long time to pass the image. And this is where games and movies are very different. Um, in a movie, the director um, and the DP, they pick where the camera is and they choose the depth of field and everything to direct your eye into the right part of the image so that you, you don't really have to pass the image yourself. Um, whereas in a video game, you are the director. Um, because you're running around, you're looking around, you're trying to figure out what's going on. And if we put too much depth into the image, it can take a really long time to just look at everything in the image and figure out what you need to do. So actually, we found that having not a lot of depth was, was better. Um, and we, we strongly encourage people when they make games to put a slider bar in and say, hey, let the, let the gamer decide how much 3D they want, let them reduce that. And one of the really nice things about games compared to movies is we can just change the distance between our cameras in real time. because. Stop. It wasn't done on the set with mechanical cameras. It's been done right there and then as we're playing the game. So we can we can have a lot of control over the amount of depth we have in the game. So um, again, carrying on with the theme of how movies and games are different, a, a video game is much like an animated feature, only it's being done in real time. So our cameras are infinitely light and small. One of the big problems you have with physical cameras is sometimes you want to reduce the interaction. 
small the size of your cameras. If you have giant movie cameras, there's a limit to how many of those you can put together. So then you won't have to get beam splitters and mirrors and things in order to get the cameras closer together. Then you've got a really heavy camera that really compromises what you can do. Obviously, if your cameras are virtual, you can do anything you like with it. Um, another issue is we're real time. We have to do everything in one thirtieth of a second, so we can't do a lot really expensive post processing. And the other thing we have to care about is that the viewer controls the camera. Like I said, the viewer is the DP. So there's a lot of things you can do in a movie scene where the camera's not moving, where you can kind of cheat. You can use two different, um, like effectively two different lenses in the same image. You could you could use a you know really wide lens for the background, and then you could use a really tight for the foreground to get a nice shot of the character's head and have a, you know nice feeling of depth in the background. That's great, but if you let the player swing, swing the camera around like this, the whole scene's kind of going to go. Boom, that's going to be fairly unpleasant. So, so those are some of the differences between a movie and a video. So, one of the best things about working in 3D is that it's been such a learning curve. Um, every film that I go to see and every game that I see is better than the last one. And I feel kind of bad because I accidentally left Avatar off the slide. It really should be up there. Um, because in a lot of ways it, it, it kicked things off. But you know, I've got a couple of games there that are stereo conversions and, and they look great. I mean, there were some stereo conversions that came out that weren't great, but there have been some that have been, you know, really, really nice. So, um, if you're if you're doing 3D, you should definitely make a point of going to see every single 3D movie that comes out. See every piece of 3D content that you can, because every one that comes out is better than the last one in terms of people are learning how to edit it, they're learning how to spend their depth budget wisely to get the best effects. So, really, it's very exciting. So. <clears throat> Let's talk about some actual games. Um, th these are a couple of games that we developed internally by, by our Intel studios. Um, they're both racing games, and they both already had two-player split-screen versions. So the nice thing about having a two-player split-screen version is you already know you can render all the geometry twice. Um, and that gives you a huge advantage. So if, if you're rendering for player one and player two, that's kind of the same as rendering for left eye and right eye. So they were able to port these games over fairly easily um, with small trade-offs in terms of pixel quality. So they had to reduce pixel resolution slightly in order because you've, you've still got to render everything twice at full resolution. Um, so Wipeout used a fixed interaxial maximum separation of 3%, quite conservative, um, not really doing anything very crazy. Um, they had to work on their HUD, they had to put their HUD into 3D. And something else that they figured out that was interesting was that um, if you have a game that switches between 2D and 3D, people will tend to take the glasses off during the 2D moments. So it's much better to keep the game 3D all the time. So even if you just have a loading screen or something like that, just have some 3D elements on it so you keep the player engaged in the 3D state of things. Encourage them not to take the glasses off. Motorstorm, similar set of issues. Um, they already had the split screen, they needed to get through right, they reduced some of their effects to get that, so maybe the game doesn't look quite as good in 3D, but at the same time, the, there were fewer effects, but the effects that are actually there are flying out of your face, and things like that, so it's actually a balance. Um, <clears throat> they played around with varying interaxial to try and give you a sense of vertigo, you know, when you go off the edge of the cliff, they'll make it feel really high. Um, so, um, yeah, they did some really neat stuff for that to make it, to make it fun in 3D. Um, something they did that's really interesting is with their HUD, with all the you know, speedometer and things like that on the screen, they lowered the opacity on them. And the really nice thing about that is you can look through them. It gives you the ability to filter on depth. So you, if you want to look at the HUD, you look at the HUD. If you don't want to look at the HUD, you can look straight through it because you'll converge behind it. And that's, that's something that's really neat in 3D that's not possible in 2D. So what about the future? Um, they, they, are, they said I could talk about the future. So, okay, serious limitation in video games today, honestly, I think the resolution needs to be higher. Um, the problem is, is if you get any kind of aliasing, any kind of jaggies, um, do, you know, do you all know what jaggies are? Okay, so jaggies are where you render a line on a computer and instead of getting a beautiful straight line, you get a line that looks like this. You get a kind of staircase effect to it. But the problem is, is if, that, if you just move the camera slightly, you get a different staircase effect. So the problem is, if you've got a different staircase effect in your left eye from your right eye, that's really hard for your brain to resolve. Um, your brain will get confused because it's, it's not the same thing in both eyes. So you can get weirdness. So getting higher resolution and better NTA, this thing just really comes down to more horsepower. When we get that, we'll, the quality of the 3D will improve because we'll have fewer artifacts in the image. 
So autostereoscopic. Autostereoscopic is 3D without glasses, and it's coming out as like a freight train. Um, Nintendo 3DS, if you guys haven't tried that out, I recommend you try it. I have the Fuji W3 here, which has an autostereoscopic display on the back of it. It's kind of cool. Um, maybe you can come see it afterwards. Um, the CES uh, manufacturers are showing large autostereoscopic TVs. Right now, the quality is not really there for the home. But, you know, maybe in five years' time it will be. Um, Maybe not. There's, there's different ways this could go. Um, okay, this is the Sony Food Blender. Um, <laughs> this is actually a volumetric 3D display, so it's kind of like a holographic display. It, you can walk around this thing and view it from any angle from all around the outside of it. It's kind of cool. We also have a video game system for doing this. It's kind of like breakout. Obviously, these are just research projects, but they are pretty cool. Um, Head-mounted displays. All right, this is where I want to get crazy. So if we can convince everybody to wear glasses all the time, why not, instead of having a TV, just put the TVs in the glasses? And if you look at the, the rate of acceleration in technology of LCDs, you can easily see that, that would be fine. There's a lot of digital SLRs now coming out that have, um, they have LCD viewfinders. I mean, the whole point of the digital SLR was you had an optical viewfinder. Now the digital viewfinders are just as good as the optical viewfinders. So why not have a 3D head-mounted display? Well, the cool thing about that is I'm getting a 3D picture, but I don't have to look at the TV anymore, I can look all around. So maybe I'm watching a movie here, and I've got my email over here, and I've got 10 games of football over here playing all at the same time. And so I can be watching a whole bunch of screens at the same time, and I can be looking around, and you know, the sound will filter based on what I'm looking at. And you can, you know, if you can imagine 360 degree, 360 degrees of TV everywhere you look is TV. That's, that's easily doable with today's technology. Um, and the cool thing with this is if I'm wearing the glasses, the glasses can track my eyes. So they can track where I'm looking. So as I look, the image can slightly shift. As my head moves, the image can slightly shift, which will reduce that feeling of looking through a window. It'll actually feel like you're actually there in 3D. And that's pretty cool. Um, other stuff you can do with that, augmented reality, you're walking down the street. I mean, if you've ever used something like Google Goggles where it displays, um, you know, the names of restaurants and places to go. You hold up your phone and you can see that stuff on your phone. Um, why not put it in the glasses? You're walking down the street, you can see where your friends are, you can see places to go and things to do. Totally do that. So what about 3D controls? <clears throat> We've got 3D games. If you've got perception of depth, maybe we need to work on making the interfaces more 3D as well. So I'm showing two things here. I'm showing PlayStation Move controller, which is a, it's a 3D spatial controller. It gives you back the position and orientation of the controller in 3D space. And that lets you do you know, precise movements in depth, precise control over things in, in actual depth in 3D space. And the other thing we can do is face tracking. So um, in this case, we're, we're tracking two guys here. And um, this is a standard Sony face library. So this guy here is Mike. It's recognized him as Mike because it's been trained to recognize him. You can see that he's smiling, his eyes are open, he's male, he's an adult, and he's not wearing glasses, and there's a bunch of other things for, for John over there as well. So you can see that we can become more intelligent about how we interact with the consumer by just simply watching the train. So, <clears throat> current situation, I mean this was supposed to be about the current situation of games as well as the future. Um, Call of Duty is stereo 3D on all platforms. Um, and it sold 7 million units on the first day. So that's between Xbox, PS3, PC, I'm not sure if the Wii, the Wii version probably was not um, But 7 million units the first day, I don't know how many units it sold right now, but it's probably twice that. And we have a wide range of software titles. All of our first party AAA titles coming out this season pretty much are all in stereo 3D. So Killzone 3 was just shipped 3D, Gran Turismo just shipped 3D. Um, if we can get the video playing in the next session, I have the Uncharted 3 trailer in 3D. So that's, if you're a gamer, that's probably quite exciting. So it's happening now, it's happening today. Um, so the question was, do you want to play 3D games? Yes, we think you do. Um, and they're there now, you can buy them today. That's probably, I didn't actually count, I was very lazy. There's enough 3D games for PlayStation 3 right now that I didn't bother to count them. There's probably 30 or 40 3D games available right now. What features will consoles need? Well, the consoles today have those features. We're, we're in a really lucky position, we can actually do it. PS3 supports HDMI 1.4, you can connect up to any 
um, 3D device and you're off to the races. And I already talked about what the future might look like. I don't know if you guys want to join me in my crazy head mounted 3D world, but it's, uh, it's one possibility. All right, thanks very much. Uh, do we have time for questions? We just switch over. We have about five minutes, yes, for question. Um, when you were talking about having to have real time uh, when you're doing games versus doing the experience when you're calculating grid simulation, especially for interactive games on the web or on your phone, right, versus just uh, recorded games. So how do you deal with clothing simulation for real time? So the question is about clothing simulation for real time. Um, I'm not a I'm not a physics guy, but um, cloth simulation is one of those things that's it's pretty much doable in real time on a current console, as long as you don't want to do anything else. Well, it depends how sophisticated yeah. you want it. Yeah, um, I've seen some stuff which is like silk dresses that looks really good, but. That was running on all the SPUs on the PS3, and the PS3 couldn't do anything else. Right. So the next generation of consoles, the next generation of high-end PCs, I think we'll start to see some really good cloth simulations. I mean, I'm still waiting for I'm still waiting for games where they simulate the muscles and attach the skins of the muscles and get real deformation of the body. Yeah. And then obviously once you've got that, you have clothes on top of it, that's really taking it to the, the next level. Yeah, you need real simulation of, yeah. of the body as well and how it interacts with yeah, we can do it. We just we're not quite there in terms of this plan. Next year, maybe. Um, I was wondering if Sony is going to actually be taking 3D more seriously. I mean, everything I've seen, everything you've shown me is all kind of 2D. Let's make it into 3D. Low cool. Um, I also kind of disagree with you with the, the 3D movies. The best 3D movie I've seen is Avatar. Uh, most of the other 3D movies are, quite frankly, crap, and they don't need to be 3D, and I feel very ripped off that I'd like to see them in 3D. <laughs> and I, I think that this is an awesome platform and has a lot of potential, uh, if somebody really takes it seriously. So what are you, what are you looking for more in, in terms of 3D? Do you want more out of screen, or are you looking for more, just more depth? Or? I'm looking for an actual experience rather than, okay, you know, like, let's just change the depth of the video, that's kind of cool. Like, I'm looking for an experience that really uh, takes into account 3D. It's interesting because I drag lots of friends to 3D movies and I spend the whole movie doing this because I'm looking to see what separation, what kind of separation they're using, where the zero parallax plane is. And a lot of the things that people have been doing in 3D, especially in the movie space, is they're like, okay, we don't want to poke people in the eye all the time. We don't want to make 3D a fad. We want this to be something that's sustainable and it's going to be around for a long time. And I think the way they're looking at 3D is similar to the way that you would look at stereo. It's like music in mono sounds, you know, the difference between listening to music in mono and listening to music in stereo, it's, the, the stereo one definitely sounds better, but it doesn't completely transform. You could still do it in mono, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's not, it's, it's maybe not even as big a leap as the, the difference between black and white and color. It's, it's more of a subtlety thing. Now you can, do things where we really get in your face and really come out. Um, but like I said, I think especially in the movie industry, they're being quite conservative about that um, because they they don't want it to be perceived as a fad. And I think that's, that's that that could be a mistake. And the other the other thing that's interesting is you can't control where people sit, so you do need to make it tunable um, for people based on where they sit. So the amount of 3D strength that you have is something you have to be pretty careful about. Uh, so, you know, in movie theater, obviously, you have a big range of where people are sitting. Nice thing about when you're at home is you do have control over the distance between the uh, the distance between the, the player and the TV. They can actually set that to something that's comfortable. So the experience of watching a 3D film versus wearing an HMD are completely different experiences. I mean, yes, they're both 3D, but in the case of HMD, 
who are immersed in the environment as opposed to simply watching it. Uh, so how soon do you think that kind of technology will be available in the home? Um, <laughs> I think you could do something where you took the 3D sources and basically put them into some sort of virtual living room. So rather than having the 360 degree ball of 3D craziness, maybe something where you just say, okay, I'm going to have a virtual living room where I can put up various 3D sources. I think we could, use, well, there are, there are commercial 3D head mounted displays available now for 400 bucks. Um, but to really commercialize it and get it out there, in five, ten years maybe. So Sony doesn't have any immediate plans for an HMP? Well, we, we showed that one at CES. Can I go backwards or something? Yeah, I, I noticed that. I okay. hadn't seen that before. Um, I don't know. It's, I, don't, I can't find it. It's back like 10 I remember. Slides. So yeah, so, so Sony is just showing one. But the nice thing, oh, there it was. So we showed one there, and that one's kind of clunky because those LCDs aren't specifically built for the product. But if you look at, I don't know, if you look at a cell phone from 10 years ago and look at the display on the cell phone, you look at the displays on cell phones now, you look at how, how much they've evolved in 10 years. I just watched The Matrix again the other day, and then got their cell phones, and then there's single color LED LCD screens with one line of text. They look so old-fashioned. So yeah, I mean, with, with the rate that this kind of technology is evolving, I could, I could see comfortable head mounted displays with the But your group at Sony isn't working on anything special? Not me. Okay, all right, thanks a lot. I just do the games. Okay. <clears throat> all right, thanks guys.